Welcome to the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Our mission is to help you thrive as a cyber risk manager. On today's episode, your virtual chief information security officer is Kip Boyle, and your virtual cybersecurity counsel is Jake Bernstein. Visit them at cyberriskopportunities.com and focallaw.com. So, Kip, what are we going to talk about today? Hey, Jake. Well, today is part two of our now annual Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report analysis and discussion. Uh, So uh, if you're listening and you heard the last episode, you know that last time we talked through the first two chapters of the report, this very big report, and we took a look at the overall findings. And today, we're going to continue to go through the report. We're going to first discuss new attack patterns that are documented. And then we're going to take a look at some industry specific information. So yeah, that's what we're going to do. Um, And let's just get going because I think there's so much data here and you and I are so susceptible to just like not paying attention to the time at all when we, when we look at stuff like this. So, uh, all right. So let's, let's just finish up a little bit from last time. Timeline data. So, that's new this year, and we should we should consider it. So, um, so first we learned that on an overall basis, discovery time in breaches has fallen quite a lot. So, if you think about five years ago in 2016, we're we're getting better at discovering breaches. We used to be just awful at it, and I wouldn't say we're great at it, but we're we're better. So that's good, um, but not really where we need it to be. And, um, and it turns out that the types of breaches that take the longest to discover um, mostly involve insider privilege misuse, right? So somebody who has access because they're an employee or a contractor or what have you, and they're just I- exceeding their privileges somehow. Maybe they've been over-provisioned or maybe they've you know found some way to cause some other trouble. But, um, it's, but there's some new insights. So this year's data shows that system intrusion is now right up there with privilege misuse, and 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 system intrusion uh, is another one of the longest time to discover types of breaches. Now, so let's look at the uh, now let's look at the other side. Uh, breaches where uh, it's obvious that something's wrong, where you can most quickly discover. That's that's you know that something's bad. Um, you know, clearly have the have the best uh, statistics. So employees are an effective early warning system for these kinds of breaches. And so the DBIR just says, hey, you know, why aren't we training them to be more effective at telling us when um, you know when something bad's happened instead of ignoring it or just ima- or just thinking that well, this is just some kind of a system glitch and I don't really want to be bothered to to call IT. Well, and, and what's interesting about the uh, the employee kind of early warning system is it's actually, it's oftentimes with the error action pattern where the employee either like lost something or screwed up. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a and, good motivation to not say right. anything. <laughs> well, it is, but but it's, you know, they report, there are re- people are increasingly reporting things early in hopes that they could, you know, it could quickly be contained. So uh, I think my advice here is why not cultivate those employees, um, it, you know, to really speak up right away and, and actually not try to, you know, sweep things under the rug just because they know it's, they know it's their fault. I mean, people are going to screw up. Well, Ideally, it's, yeah. I know it's a hard thing, but, but it, it's it really be hard ideal. because, because, you know, a lot of companies really are not, um, are not, you know, don't don't have uh, a history of thanking people for for admitting mistakes, right? Admitting Usually that not. you've made a mistake is is not uh, is not something that most people look forward to in most places of employment. So you've either got to have a culture, right, an entire culture of making it okay for people to do this, or you just have to hope that the person who did it has a strong individual character where they're willing to say something despite the fact that they're pretty sure it's not going to be received well. 
Agreed. And I, and I think that's kind of why the report says, hey, look, it's actually it's more important than ever to to create the culture that would allow people to report because it's, yeah. it's important. Yeah. And, and there's a there's a term that I like, uh, a blameless postmortem. And we actually saw in the in the recent White House executive order uh, uh, asked for the creation of a national blameless postmortem uh, following a, you know, any kind of a giant uh you know, country level cyber attack. And so I think that's good. Yeah, that is good. Okay. Well, um, shall we move into the incident classification patterns? Because guess what? Um, this year they have changed things up. Maybe yeah. you start, just give us a little bit of history. Yeah, sure. So, um, and they do often change as you know change the way that they do data analysis and the way they present data based on their own learnings based on how the data itself is shifting and so you know we just we just have to uh, accept and expect that this is going to happen so back in 2014 DBIR introduced uh, the idea of incident classification patterns and and the idea is that they were trying to simplify what would otherwise be really complex combinations of actors, actions, assets, and attributes that you typically see. And, um, and so, you know, like I said, the data has changed and the patterns have, have changed. And so they've, they've updated, they've adapted, they have improvised, they have innovated. They have indeed. So um, I, I think the easiest way to kind of do this is just to take a look at which patterns have been retired. So those ones are payment card skimmers, crimeware, cyber espionage, and point of sale. Um, you know, now that's not to say that some of these things have disappeared. For example, payment card skimmers um, has been lumped into the everything else category. Um, but in terms of like the overall scheme, we they have uh they've a lot of these have been replaced by social engineering and system intrusion. Um, the ones that are back, just to be clear, are denial of service, basic web application attacks, lost and stolen assets, which don't really change. A lost or stolen asset is going to be lost or stolen no matter what. Uh, miscellaneous errors, privilege misuse, and then of course everything else, which is is uh, a, a big bucket. Yeah. Um, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm a typical, I'm a typical person, uh, in the sense that, um, changes like this kind of like disrupt me a bit. And, and when they first happen, I don't really like them very much, but at the same time, you know, it's absolutely necessary. I couldn't imagine how useful this report would not be if they still used the same approaches that they did when they, you know, first, the first time they published. So, um, but anyway, there's a lot that has changed and we just have to get used to it. But let me, let me summarize um, a couple of other uh, changes. So, so like you said, payment card skimmers uh, is now lumped into everything else. And, um, you know, you mentioned point of sale, crimeware, cyber espionage, everything else. Um, those are now characteristics of the of the breach, right? So we we're still going to see them in the data, but now they've they're, they've sort of reoriented themselves uh, so that um, you know they're not really driving uh, the report, but still we can you know get some insight on them. So so I think that is worth looking at. So let's say that, and this is this is really complicated. Actually, it's not, which is why it works so well. Um, if social engineering was a significant aspect of the breach, then guess where it goes? Into the social engineering pattern. A simple attack where the initial intrusion point was a web application, basic web application attacks. So you, you kind of see how this works. And um, you know uh, something that's more elaborate where the attacker gained access, pokes around possibly with you know the point of entry remaining undiscovered, that gets categorized as system intrusion. And, you know, I particularly like the thinking behind retiring cyber espionage and crimeware. Uh, our defense controls do not care if the attacker has a, quote, cushy government job or is a free market entrepreneur, in the words of the, uh, the always entertaining DBIR. Um, you know, this makes sense to me because really, what's the difference from our perspective? You know, if, if the person hacking into your system to do a ransomware is, you know, a government employee of a country that 
you know, is is not an ally versus a, a, an organized criminal, it doesn't really matter. And I, I think it's I think what what's more important is how these things happen. And so that is what that is what they've done. And there's a convenient table um, of the new the new patterns. I don't think we need to really read it, but it is there if people want to take a look. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's worthwhile. Now that's figure 47 in the report. So you can flip to that and and orient yourself to, to these uh, changes that we're talking about. Um, crimeware. I, I cannot help but to think about um, my mentor, Don Parker, when I see the term crimeware, right, as opposed to malware, as opposed to software, right? So in, in 1998, he published a book and in that book, he talked about automated crime, where you could write software to, um, you know, to, uh, uh, to, to do all kinds of criminal things. And at the time, I remember thinking that that was just fascinating to me that, you know, I mean, it kind of made sense, but it still was kind of a groundbreaking thought. You could write software to automate payroll functions. Well, now you could write software to automate criminal behavior. So anyway, just throwing it out there. Crimeware, uh, we loved you, but um, you know we're not going to see you anymore in the DBIR. Um, okay, so moving on. So there, there's a lot of data about the uh, incident patterns, but um, but we think that's probably best left to uh, individuals who have a specific interest in that data. So we're not going to really unpack that on the episode today. So let's move on to industry data and see what we can learn. And remember, the idea of industry data here is that when you are in the hospitality industry versus banking versus manufacturing, you really should be scrutinizing your industry data and using it as a basis for reporting to the board of directors, to your senior decision makers. And um, and I think that's just going to increase your credibility. It's going to better prepare you for the specific types of attacks that are uh, commonly observed. I mean, I, I talk with my customers all the time about the need to prioritize, 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 because you have a limited budget and you have unlimited risks. So this industry data is going to help you understand what your top risks are. And so that's just... That's just risk management goodness. I mean, you know. Um, now, before we start diving into it, one one kind of caveat, page 53 of the DBIR for this year. So there's a little snippet about behavioral science and how you could use knowledge of behavior, behavioral science to create effective cybersecurity cultures. And you really need to to take a look at that. And uh, Jake and I are really thinking about making that an, a, a separate episode in the future. So if you, if you look at that, you'll, you'll actually be preparing yourself uh, for, a, for a future episode. And most importantly, you'll start to think, if you haven't already, about uh, shifting your culture. It's, it, it really, I think, is the, you know, if I, if I had a dollar to spend to deal with cyber risk, and I had all the basic stuff dealt with, all the basic cyber hygiene stuff dealt with, like multi-factor authentication. I would want to spend it on culture shift. It's not easy, but that's where I'd want to spend it. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I'm pretty convinced that that we will do a, this episode. I mean, I think as a sneak peek and, and kind of teaser, you know, it, Verizon has this, uh, the Verizon Media um, overall conglomerate actually says in this in this page here that it be, that it believes the simulations and training offered by most security education teams do not mimic real life situations do not parallel the behaviors that lead to breaches and are not measured against real attacks that the organization receives that's a little bit of an indictment of of of, of a fairly extensive industry and and I think it's fascinating to why they say that well yeah, they really a, want yeah i mean i i agree it's a it's a really weak soup that we're serving up to people right awareness i don't care much about awareness i want you to do stuff i want exactly. you to see things for what they are and i want you to do something about it right i want action i don't want i don't i don't want just awareness this is um i think the inertia of initial 
trainings that we did 20, 25 years ago, where we, you know, where we, just, we were just trying to broach the subject in a gentle way without freaking people out or whatnot, right? So it's like, hey, we just want you to have some awareness of what's going on. Well, we're long past the awareness stage. And I know we've got some fishing simulators out there that that we can use to actually train people. And I think I think that's good as far as it goes. But what we really need, and we've talked about this so many times, we need readiness, right? We need we need plans and we need to practice those plans. Um, we actually need to change behavior that way. So anyway, uh, off my soapbox. Yeah, well, don't worry. You'll get a chance to, to, to get on that soapbox uh, very much so. So, okay, so table four on page 65. This is kind of the... Um, the the overview of of the industry numbers um what's really interesting and striking here is that uh that very first line uh you know it says total which normally would be not as interesting but but in this case you can see that um of the incidents there there is uh 20 so uh, there's a total of 29,207 like we said last time 27,351 of those we don't know if it's a small or medium sized business. <laughs> so that means, I mean, and again, remember it, it, the DBIR team has very exacting standards on data quality. And so, you know, I appreciate them, them being, um, you know, open here. You might wonder, well, how can you not know what the size of the company is? Well, someone has to tell you. And if they don't tell you, then you don't know. And so, you know, and the, the situation is, is, only marginally better with with breaches. Five thousand two hundred fifty eight total. Four thousand six hundred eighty eight. We don't know um, if they're small or or large. So, you know, I, it's still enough numbers to get useful information, um, which we'll talk about at the very very end of the differences between large and and then SMBs. But I did want to kind of you know bring that to uh, everyone's attention there. Uh, yes. Um, hmm. Well, I don't know. I <laughs> I'm holding myself back because I want to unpack that. But um, we'll but get I'm, there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so we'll get there. Let's let's. Yeah, yeah. I, I will defer. Okay. Yeah, and then and then just to let people know, pages sixty six and sixty seven um, kind of contain the uh, the full kind of you know grand overview, uh, you know breaches and and incident patterns. That it breaks it down by you know the on the on the the what is that the x axis has the the um, industry code and then it's it's broken between the asset action and pattern so you can really get a ton of information just from these just from these uh these two figures so i, I, oh, I don't yeah. know that it, because it's difficult to discuss something visually on a podcast you know, gosh, if there was only a way to fix that, Kip. Um, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's that's Jake admitting that I've been uh, uh, pestering him for months now to go video on this podcast. So there you go, little inside podcast information right there. Yeah. Regardless, um, they're there for everyone to look at. So um, I don't think it's where you know that's that's just kind of where you need to look. So, yeah. All right, Kim, why don't you take us to our first specific industry that, um, you know, tends to be common to our client base? Yeah, absolutely. Now, we're not going to cover all the industries, but we're going to cover the ones that um, that we're most familiar with. So financial and uh, and insurance as an industry. So there's, um, there's a code, there's a coding system that is being used here um, that's, uh, that's super helpful. NAI, uh, N-A-I-C-S. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's the North American Industry Classification System. So if you're listening and you're not located in, in North America, these codes are probably not as, as relevant, but um, but they're still very useful for understanding different industries. Assuming that your country has similar industries, they probably do. But I just wanted to let you know that this is, this is how things are being broken out. So NAICS 52, financial and insurance. So the interesting find this year in the report is that 44% of all breaches, not incidents, remember a breach and an incident has a separate definition and breaches are a subset of incidents. Okay, so 44% of all breaches were caused by internal actors. So think about it, 44% 
are caused by by people internal. In other words, trusted people, people you've vetted who are on your team uh, are are behind 44% of all breaches in this industry. Now, I, I'm not telling you this to make you paranoid, but the, these are these are errors, right? Many of them are, are are really errors, right? So the majority of them are just people sending it. It could be as simple as people sending on your team sending an email to the wrong person, right? So we're not talking about we're not talking about malicious insiders uh, exclusively. We're just talking about people just making mistakes for the most part. Um, and then the other thing, what you were going to say something, Jake? I do. I just want to you know quickly highlight that that. It's important to remember that that a lot of these breaches and these incidents are caused by internal actors. And in the vast majority of cases, that just means human error, a mistake. I think it's really important to remember that, that, you know, this is why, again, you know, maybe uh, foreshadowing th- th- to that to that <laughs> culture to that culture episode um, is just so important right is that is that people do make mistakes and uh, you can't eliminate that um, so well, not completely no but I mean you can train people to you can increase their reliability right that's what training is all about and certainly practice right practice 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 when you practice stuff your error rate will go down now the other thing about insider threats right so you got errors I also want to make sure that you understand that if I receive a, a phishing uh, email and I actually follow its instructions, that's still a, an error, right? But it's an error not brought on by my own uh, lack of attention to detail so much as it is brought on by the I've been manipulated by an outsider. So I'm so I'm still an insider threat because I'm sub, because I'm allowing myself to to be manipulated by an outsider. So I just want to point that out as well. Um, okay, so, uh, so another thing that I want to say about financial and insurance as an industry that pops out from this report is that 74% of breaches are discovered by external parties. 70, so, so three quarters of all breaches are not discovered by the people who actually caused those breaches. And that's that's been true for a long time, is that the majority of, of breach discovery does not come from the people responsible for it. Um, well, yeah. No, hold on. I think you. I think you're. I think you misspoke. It seventy four percent of breaches are discovered by not the victim. That's what's. Yeah, people. So hold on. Let's let's restate that just to make sure no one's confused. Seventy four percent of breaches are discovered by external parties. Thirty eight percent are the, actually the bad guys themselves saying, "Hey, I'm in your system." Yeah. Um, and thirty six percent are notification from monitoring services. So. You know, only twenty four or twenty six percent, I guess it is. Yeah, um, ha- are discovered by the victim. That's the key finding. Oh, oh, is oh, that- but but hold on, victim. As, okay, so let's define victim. So in a data breach, the victim. I don't. I don't think of the victim as primarily the company that fumbled the ball. Rather, I think the victim is the people whose whose data was compromised. So are is that how are you how are you well, defining victim? I, so I'm using victim there as the as the the entity that was attacked. Okay. Which means the yeah. So you the, know, so the business or the organization. Uh, there's multiple victims. Right. Okay. The business or the organization. Yeah. Ah. Uh, okay. The target of the attacker. The target of the attack. Okay. Well, yeah. This is why you need precise language. I I can I can defined see, terms I can again. See, the, see why I can it's see so important. Point. Yeah, 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 yeah. For sure, for sure. Okay, all right. So, um, so that's financial and insurance. You know, I, I, we could obviously talk a long, long time about any one of these. Let's move on to the next one, which I think is healthcare. Right, Jake? It is healthcare, indeed. So this is NAICS or NAICS code sixty two. Um, similar issues here, basic human error, misdelivery, whether it's, whether it's email or physical mail, interestingly enough, physical items, um, is the most common type of error. Uh, ransomware is a big hit, obviously. That's not, no surprise. There wasn't a ton to say about healthcare this year, um, except one, one piece of good news is that malicious internal action types have dropped off yet again, I think for the third year in a row, and are no longer in the, in, in the top three for, for this, uh, this, this area. Well, that's so, good. So that is good. So healthcare, you know, um, 
pretty it, much the way it was last year for healthcare. Though. Pretty much the way it was. Uh, you know, really, again, the human error being an issue. Uh, one thing that is interesting uh, is that uh, for some interesting uh, unknown reason, personal data has actually overtook medical information as the type of, of information taken, which is interesting just because you would think if you're going to have medical data, you'd think it would come from the healthcare industry. So you know, that's, that's the, uh, the report writers found that interesting as well. So Yeah. Well, if you work in the healthcare industry, then you need to uh, dig into this, right? Unpack this a little bit more. Um, get really, really familiar with the, uh, with the industry, industry-specific data for yourself. Um, let's turn our attention now to NAICS 51. And I almost feel like, like we could like do a quiz uh, based just on the NAICS codes, but that's information, right? The information industry, which is uh, varied uh, in terms of its makeup, but, um, but, but the information industry has been in the news a lot lately, right? So we're, they were talking about technology companies and so forth, like SolarWinds and Kaseya. So these are uh, digital supply chain attacks, for example, that have happened um, in the last few months. Uh, God, this industry just seems to struggle with credentials stealing botnets, uh, errors resulting from misconfiguration are also depressingly common. And it's just, it's like the cobbler's kids have no shoes. I don't know if people know what a cobbler is anymore. I guess I should probably upgrade my, <laughs> my analogy, but yeah. <laughs> so a cobbler is somebody who makes shoes and you know, we don't have those anymore, but you know, but the idea, right, is that these, you know, information industry participants like technology companies you know, really should have their act together. They know the most, they know more about this than their customers do, or at least that's the presumption, right? So, but um, yeah, it's concerning that external actors typically deliver the news that a breach has occurred. And um, in 50% of the cases, it's the bad actors themselves who alert the victim, right? So it's not just that they're kind of their own worst enemy, um, but they, they don't even realize until somebody tells them. And half the cases. So, um, and by the way, denial of service, this is um, the industry that seems to really uh, be victimized by denial of service attacks more than any other. So we're talking like 90% of all the um, hacking actions observed for information are showing up in this category, right? Am I reading that correctly? And that's not really... Yeah, and that's not really surprising. Uh, you know, these are your these are your servers, your your kind of infrastructure companies. So, you know, this or, is or where you really if you're like a bad SAS, guy, this right? is like a SaaS provider, right? Software yeah. as a service. I mean, yeah. your website SaaS is provider. your provider. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So that and then, you know that that's really it, it's. I'd say there's there's certain I mean obviously denial of service can occur anywhere but this is definitely be the place to to go for it. Um, okay, manufacturing um, uh, code thirty one through thirty three really two main patterns here: social engineering and ransomware. Um, for some reason, they decided to give this industry a neat little attack lifecycle chart, and that allows us to give you the following hard hitting insights: um, breaches uh, tend to start with social engineering via phishing or hacking via usually use of stolen credentials. Um, they continue with malware and additional stolen credentials with hacking. And the vast majority are ending with ransomware. Um, and, and so, you know, I think the idea here is, you know, th these little, uh, these attack lifecycle chart breakdowns, I think do give you clues as to how to defend against the most common type of attack. So, you know, manufacturing has really been hit recently. Uh, it was the, the meatpacking, JBS meatpacking plants uh, a few months ago. Um, uh, just lots and lots of, of manufacturing attacks. And I think it tends to be that, you know, these are not, uh, generally speaking, these aren't, quote, technology companies. And they, they tend to have a blind spot. Um, it would be good to have them remember more often that if they go down, then, you know, 
there's no goods flowing into the economy, so that's bad. Sure. Yeah, I mean, these manufacturers are, uh, they have three codes, right? 31, 32, and 33, which tells you how abundant they are, right? That they actually have to have three separate codes. And they're, yeah, and they're or, all... Uh, or tangible. how old this classification system is. <laughs> well, okay, maybe a combination of both. But manufacturing, like, I popularly thought of manufacturing as like heavy industry, like steel or automobiles or something like that. But, you know, if, if you grow fruit and you pack that fruit into boxes, or if you're a dairy uh, farmer and you put milk into, into containers and, 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 sh- and send them out to stores, that's, those are forms of manufacturing, right? I mean, you may not be doing much to the apple that you are packing. Well, there, uh, there, is an, uh, there is an agriculture. Yeah, I, I, I just... There is just, an agriculture uh, yes. code. But I'm speaking more generally, right? If you any anytime you have an assembly line, a packing line, anything like that, where oh yes, yes, you know, definitely materials come in one door, finished materials go out another door. I'm just speaking very, very generally, right? You, you're going to you need to pay attention to this this data here is the point that I'm getting at, right? Because ransomware 61.2 percent that's the whole point the whole point is you've lost control of your technology and you may not think of yourselves as a technology company i guarantee you i see this over and over and over again um i've I've had apple growers say to me like hey we're farmers we don't want to be tech experts and i'm like well um you're actually a technology company that happens to deal in cherries right or whatever because you can't survive without your computer controlled uh packing lines you know and and you can't wash your fruit and get it into a box or a bag or whatever without a computer so you really are a technology company um you just don't you just don't you don't recognize that you've had that you've you know that that change has happened to you yet so i so sometimes we're our own worst enemy anyway so uh I've seemed to be getting on my soapbox a lot today. Maybe I do that all the time and I'm just realizing it. <laughs> okay, we ready to move on to uh, another uh, area. This is NAICS 54. So 54 is uh, labeled as professional, scientific, and technical services. Um, and let's take a look at that 1,892 incidents. 630 breaches, about a third, and system intrusion, social engineering, and basic web application attacks. You put all those together, that's 81% of all the breaches for this industry. Uh, Credentials are most commonly compromised, and they help complete a ransomware attack. So the ransomware plus confirmed breach pattern is really strong in this industry, very evident. Social social engineering, yeah, and 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 that ref- also a major pattern, yeah, and the, the ransomware, the the ransomware plus confirmed breach. That's the whole like um, double or so called you know ransomware two point idea where it's not you know just just to make sure that you know having a backup isn't going to be enough to get you out of their their cl- their their grip. They're also going to threaten to uh, to release the information. So that's that's what that's what that's referring to. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you could restore control over your systems and still feel um, under threat because, like, oh man, yep, they, exactly. they got our they got our customer records and and you know they're going to auction them off to the highest bidder. And if you go to if you look at the Happy Blog, which is uh, you got to use a Tor browser to get to it, but you can see um, our evils um, parade of victims that they are auctioning off, um, you know, the, their records. And we mentioned this uh, when we did the continuing legal education um, back on June 23rd. And you can get that replay if you, um, uh, if you go onto YouTube. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that's what's going on here. And um, it seems to be pretty effective in favor of the criminals. So, okay, so that's the last industry that we specifically wanted to focus on in today's episode. There's more, and we haven't even scratched really uh, the the depth of data and insight in each one of these areas. So um, get get your DBIR, crack it open, and start digging, ladies and gentlemen. Well, let's see. What else we got to talk about before we wrap up this episode? Now... 
Now you get to do your SMB breaches. Um, <laughs> so it's one, one more soapbox. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. So let's, let's small, medium business. So breaches affecting small, medium businesses. So uh, the confirmed numbers aren't very high here uh, in the report. But, you know, they, they could be, you know, you had said it earlier, Jake, where, you know, they had a lot of information, but they weren't really sure about, you know, the sizes of these companies. And I find that's kind of surprising. I, I wonder if that was just a lack of resources to do the research, because when you go on LinkedIn, for example, and you pull up a, a company profile, uh, it's pretty clear how big they are, right? It, the, the precision of the data may not be all that great, right? Maybe they've got 75 employees and LinkedIn's only showing 62 or whatever. But I mean, just as far as like putting them in a, in a, in a bucket labeled SMB, I would think it'd be pretty straightforward. Dun and Bradstreet, there's got to be other places where you can figure that out. But again, maybe it's just allocation of resources. They have a lot of data they have to comb through. Maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe they'll figure out a way to get through that. But in any event, Here's the point. Here's the takeaway. You look at this report and you and you have to be impressed with the fact that being a small or a medium-sized business is not any kind of a safe harbor for you. It's not getting safer. I don't know that it that it's been safe to be an SMB for even for for several years now. You know, with automated cyber attacks, it it doesn't matter how big you are, right? They're just they're just they're just uh, the cyber criminals are just using automation to examine IP addresses, and they they don't necessarily know which IP address belongs to whomever. I, mean, I don't think they really stop to think about that. They just start plowing through IP addresses, looking for the vulnerabilities that would allow them to uh, conduct their attacks. So, being small or medium is in no way um, again a safe harbor for you. So. If you if you know if you're listening to this podcast, you probably don't believe that, right? Because the people who believe that they're in a safe harbor probably don't think that they have any reason to be listening to a podcast like this. So probably this is preaching to the choir. But if you know somebody who is a senior decision maker at an SMB org, maybe maybe you should ha- uh, encourage them to just listen to to this episode. Maybe it's just the last five minutes. I don't know. Maybe it'll help. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think, you know, it's, it, there's so many wake up calls uh, for SMBs here. Um, you know, they're the one area where uh, large business has kind of gotten better is that they are discovering uh, breaches faster, but uh, that's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a huge, huge differential. So yeah. Well, anyway, I, I, you know, I, I think the big, I think the big, the big wake up call to the extent that there is going to be one, it probably has to do with the, uh, the Kaseya, uh, ransomware attack, um, from early July, 2021. And we'll probably do a future episode. Once the details of that become completely clear It's the time that we're recording this, the details are not totally clear, but what we are seeing is, is that a strong suspicion that the majority of the victims are small, medium businesses and that they got that way because of uh, their use of a vulnerable IT service provider. So again, we'll unpack that later on, but um, it's looking like this is going to be the case study for a long time to come to prove this point that a small, medium business is not the same as a safe harbor from cyber attacks. Okay. Definitely anything, any 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 uh, final okay. comments, Jake, or is that a wrap? Download download your copy and take a look. Yep. All right. So I am, in fact, going to declare that we have wrapped up this episode of the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. And today we did part two of our analysis of the 2021 edition of the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report to see what we could learn and to tease you, our audience, into getting your own copy and doing your own research and using it to justify uh, your cyber risk management program. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Thanks for joining us today on the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Remember that cyber risk management is a team sport, so include your senior decision makers, legal department, HR, and IT for full effectiveness. So if you want to manage cyber as the dynamic business risk it has become, we can help. Find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and focallaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.